Well, I'm so happy that he joined us this week. As I mentioned in the introduction, we are in Portugal taping special episodes of our program. And this is a real thrill for me to be here in Portugal because Portugal is the birthplace of my parents. My mom and dad were born here and in 1958, they immigrated to Canada. My brother and I were both born in Canada, in Toronto more specifically, but we've never really lost our connection to our Portuguese roots and our Portuguese heritage. Today's program, I want to share with you some of the incredible history of this nation. Portugal happens to be one of the oldest nations in Europe. Now, it has been an independent nation since 1143. In about 1000 BC, the Celtic peoples entered the Iberian Peninsula. They were skilled iron workers and goldsmiths and they cremated their dead. They integrated with the indigenous inhabitants who were already known as Iberians. Thus, some early writers refer to these newcomers as Celtiberians. In the northern forests of Iberia, they found everything necessary for their animals and Evidence of the importance of herding is found in the large number of granite sculptures of certain animals, especially pigs, that are present in the area. These pigs are said to have been associated with fertility, authority, and power. The veneration of animals was not unique to the Iberian Celts, since Irish Celts also kept sacred cattle and royal oxen, swine, and sheep. Well, the Celts lived in villages uh, like this one with round stone houses. And these uh, fortified settlements were called castros. This embryo of a town in the rough design of a Celtic castro is more than 2,000 years old. This settlement was protected by walls and there were also sheds there for the cattle. This place where we are is called Citania de Briteros. It is one of the most interesting examples of the Castro culture that developed in the Iberian Peninsula, probably in the second century BC. These settlements were situated at great heights so their inhabitants could keep watch for potential invaders. You know, many of Portugal's present cities have their origins here in these Castros. Évora is one of Portugal's finest and most delightful towns. It's a true open-air museum with a large number of wonderfully preserved monuments and buildings of public interest that led UNESCO to protect it as a World Heritage Site. Each age has left its trace on Évora. It was the Celts who called it Ibora, and the Romans gave it its most famous landmark, the Roman Temple of Évora. Dating from the second century, it is one of the Iberian Peninsula's best preserved Roman monuments. It's raised on a three meter high stone platform with 14 of the original 18 granite Corinthian columns still standing. The Romans overran Gaul, today's France, in seven years, but it took them almost two centuries to completely overtake Iberia. The Romans settled everywhere, but their numbers in the north were comparatively small. The south was more to their liking, which was better for growing wheat, olives, and grapes. They eventually imposed their language upon the entire peninsula, and their code of law was applied. And it ultimately formed the basis of the Portuguese legal code. Forums, temples, and law courts were built in the cities, and large-scale agriculture was conducted roads and bridges, many still in evidence throughout Portugal were created, as well as a large system of farming called latifundios, uh, still seen in the area of the Alentejo. This here is Cunibriga, the best preserved Roman ruins in Portugal, the largest Roman settlement in Portugal. Cunibriga was built in layers, and some of the earliest layers date back to the 9th century BC. The Romans arrived in the second century AD, conquering the Celtic inhabitants and establishing a city that grew and flourished. The life of the Romans in Cunibriga can be traced in the house of Canterbury, the residence of a nobleman in one of the largest houses ever discovered in the Western Roman Empire. 
The opulent villa included its own bathing complex, a sophisticated heating system, ornamental pools and gardens. The mosaics here on this entire site are in almost perfect condition, which incredibly, they are detailed and colorful designs that include uh, motifs of uh, beasts and hunting scenes and mythological themes. There are also ruins of the temples, a forum, an aqueduct, water conduits, drains, an elaborate uh, piping system that heated the town's public and private bathrooms. Conimbriga was destroyed during the barbarian invasions in 468 AD. Uh, the first hordes of barbarians, the, the Suevi and the Vandals, they penetrated the peninsula in around 409 AD with the Suevi, who settled predominantly in the north and northwest, making what is now the Portuguese city of Braga as their capital. Now, the German rulers didn't completely sweep away the Romans. You see, they maintained certain parts of their civilization, which they had come to admire. Now, visibly, you could tell them apart very easily. Uh, the Germans tended not to cut their hair, uh, while the Romans would definitely clip theirs. Probably the greatest contribution made by the Suevi was in the area of land usage and the introduction of the quadrangular plow. As mentioned earlier, the Suevi, who maintained residences in the north and northwest, did so because there the climate and the soil was more conducive to the kinds of crops that they would grow. Well, in 516, it was the turn of the Visigoths. You see, the Visigoths were commissioned to expel the other barbarians, and they soon overpowered both the Alans and the Vandals. But the Suevi, well, that proved no easy matter, and it really wasn't until 585 that this was accomplished. The Visigoths then dominated this region for a little more than a century, roughly until 711. Now, we are standing at the ruins of an old Visigothic temple a chapel from the 7th century. It is called the Igreja de São Gion, the Church of São Gion. It is believed to be one of the oldest in all of Portugal, and it is a classic example of Visigothic architecture. In 632 AD, after the death of the prophet Muhammad, his followers undertook a program of world conquest in the name of Allah and Islam. And by the year 700, their forces had swept across North Africa and had subdued Morocco. They crossed into what is now Spain in 711 and over the years subjugated almost the entire peninsula with incredible speed. However, as opposed to the previous invaders of Iberia, these Muslims, who were named Moors by the Christians, they chose to settle mostly in the south. We are here in the town of Sintra, and here in the town of Sintra you have the Castle of the Moors, or what the Portuguese call Castelo dos Mouros. It's located at the top of the hill, and it's a symbol that denotes Muslim and Islamic domination in Portugal. Now, with the Moors came some technical advances. The Moors fortified several cities. The works of ir irrigation from Roman days were restored and perfected. Water power was used to drive milling machinery. And the use of linen paper made the multiplication of books much easier than in the days of parchment rolls. And as a result, literacy was widespread. Christians continuously tried to get rid of the Moors, and the first attempt is said to have been as early as 10 years after their invasion. This was when a man named Pelagio won the first Christian victory against the hated invaders in the north of Iberia. And though the military significance was small at the time, it lifted Christian morale. And over the years, the Christians reconquered several areas from north to the south of the peninsula. In 1095, Afonso VI of Leon decided to bring this region here under more direct control of his family. To Urica, his legitimate daughter, he assigned Galicia as far south as Lima. 
she had married Raymond, the son of the Count of Burgundy, thereby establishing a link with the kings of France. The Portocalense County he gave to his illegitimate daughter, Dona Teresa. You see, she had married Enrique, also from the House of Burgundy. From her patrimony and dynasty, the future Portuguese monarchy directly descended. Now this here is the castle at Guimarães. It is very likely that this was the residence of Count Enrique and the birthplace of his son, Afonso Enriquez. On the death of her husband, Count Enrique, Dona Teresa attempted to rule the Portocalense County herself, assuming the title of queen. You see, she had her eye on Galicia, and to that end, she married a Galician nobleman by the name of Count Fernão Pérez de Trava. The Portocalense nobility feared they might become subject to the Galicians. Many of the leading nobles took up arms against Dona Teresa. Well, the opposition forces were led by her son, Don Alfonso Henriques. June of 1128, the two parties met here on this field for the Battle of Saint Mamed. The Portocalins were the victors. Don Alfonso Henriques expelled his mother and her consort and took over the reins of the government. This place right here, it marks the birthplace of Portugal. The 57 year reign of Don Afonso Henriques provided continuity and a firm basis for his state. He was peacefully succeeded by his eldest son, Don Sancho I. He gained the nickname O Povoador, meaning he encouraged land settlement. He continued in his father's policy of administering the new kingdom through councils that were elected by the principal towns and villages. Now right behind me, this is the monastery of Santa Cruz in Coimbra. Construction on the monastery began in 1131 under the patronage of Don Afonso Enriquez. Among some of the famous scholars of the monastery was St. Anthony of Lisbon, who later joined the Franciscan order here in the city of Coimbra. The king also commissioned royal tombs, and today, the bodies of both Afonso Henriques and Sancho I, the first kings of Portugal, rest here in the monastery. One last story before we close. Agora é tarde, Inês é morta. It's too late, Inês is dead, is a Portuguese saying used in everyday life. It has been in use for more than 550 years. It refers to one of the most tragic heroines of Portuguese history. Inês Pérez de Castro was the daughter of the powerful Pedro Fernandes de Castro, an illegitimate grandson of King Sancho IV of Castile. She arrived in Portugal in 1340 as a lady-in-waiting to her cousin, Princess Costanza of Castile. And she had come to marry the heir to the Portuguese throne, Don Pedro, son of King Don Afonso IV. Well, immediately the crown prince set his eyes on Inez. He falls in love with her. Don Pedro went ahead and married the Castilian princess in 1340, but on the 13th of November, 1345, she dies shortly after giving birth to their third child, Prince Dom Fernando. Well, since he is no longer married, Dom Pedro went after Inez. He brought her back to Portugal and they settled here in Coimbra, where they would live together openly. Inez lived here in the palace of the convent of Santa Clara Velha. This is where she would receive the love letters that Pedro wrote. You see, legend has it that he used to send her his love letters through a small pipe carried away by the waters from Quinta do Pombal Springs, today known as Quinta das Lagrimas. Those notes would come to this place here, the Palace of Santa Clara Velha. Meanwhile, Dom Pedro became increasingly close to Inez's brothers. They tried to convince him to claim the throne of Castile, thus endangering the already fragile relations between Portugal and that neighboring kingdom. Well, soon Dom Pedro was persuaded by their arguments 
and he declared himself a pretender to the thrones of Leon and Castile. It became evident to the Portuguese king and to the aristocracy that the Castro clan would end up dragging the future monarch and his kingdom into the fights of their neighbors. Now, these fearsome prospects led the king and his advisors to begin to look at ways to free the prince from the damaging influence of the Castro clan. Well, the death of Inez started to seem as a solution. Initially, Don Alfonso IV was reluctant to agree to such an extreme action against the mother of his own grandchildren. But on January the 7th, 1355, while Pedro was away from home, the king called his counselors to a meeting right here in the castle of Monte Mor Uvelho. And at the end, he finally decided to send the three of his counselors, Pedro Coelho, Álvaro Gonçalves, and Diogo Lopes Pacheco, to Coimbra in order to kill Inês. Well, as soon as the assassins and the king arrived here at the palace of the convent of Santa Clara Velha, Inês appeared before them surrounded by her children and appealed to the king. You see, the king had been struggling between the needs of the state and his own feelings as a grandparent. And finally, he left the room saying to the counselors, just do whatever you want. And as soon as the king had turned his back, the sentence was carried out. Inez de Castro was executed. When Don Pedro heard that Inez had been killed, that terrible news drove him into a fury. And knowing that his own father had ordered the killing, well, Don Pedro then staged the revolt against the king. And for several months, with the support of the Castro brothers, his troops swept through the country and laid siege to the city of Porto. Finally, the queen, Don Pedro's mother, intervened to end the revolt and bring about a reconciliation between father and son. Well, Don Pedro formally promised to forgive the incident. Two years pass, Don Afonso IV dies, Don Pedro now succeeds to the Portuguese throne. And as soon as he is crowned in 1357, and in spite of his promises of forgiveness, now King Dom Pedro I arrested two of the assassins. He then had them tortured and executed in a barbaric but highly symbolic way. From one of the men, he had his heart ripped out of his body through his back. And from the other, the heart was pulled out through the chest. You see, all this happened in front of the royal palace where the king was able to watch the terrible scene while having his dinner. On June the 12th, 1360, the king announces that some years earlier, he had married Inez in a secret ceremony in the town of Braganza. Well, the Bishop of Guarda and one of his servants well, they were presented as witnesses of the wedding, although neither one of them seemed to remember the date when the marriage had taken place. Well, nevertheless, Inez de Castro was now declared King Pedro's legitimate wife. Well, and therefore, she is the lawful queen of Portugal. The king then orders that her body be exhumed and taken from the palace of Santa Clara in Coimbra to this location here the monastery in Alcubasa, to the place called the Tomb of the Kings. She was buried here in an extraordinary ceremony on the 2nd of April, 1361. I hope you're enjoying the program from Portugal. Uh, we're about to go into the monastery there in Alcubasa and show you the unique layout of the tombs of Dom Pedro and Inez. And just wanted to let you know that we weren't able to go in with our regular equipment. And so, you know, the sound may not be the quality that we would have liked, but I hope you enjoy this special segment. The King Dom Pedro commissioned this elaborate tomb, marble tomb, for his wife, who is the
Castro. The placement of the tombs here in the church of Santa Maria is really quite interesting. You have at this end the tomb of the Queen, and there's the Castro. And straight across, right at the other end of the church, we're going to see the tomb of the King, Don Pedro. Now, there's a lot of theories around why the placement is kind of unique this way. Well, it has led many to believe that Dom Pedro and Inez de Castro believed in the resurrection of the dead at the second coming of Christ. And by placing the tombs in this position, at the day of the resurrection, the first thing that they will see when they come out of the tombs will be each other. One of the things that leads people to believe that is that on this end of the tomb here, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see it, but down below on what they call here the wheel of life is inscribed until the end of the world. You see, Don Pedro and Inez de Castro believed like Paul when he wrote to the Thessalonians. For the Lord himself will descend with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first.